Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. We also have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit filmflorida.creator-spring.com to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and more. Elston Torres is a Cuban-born, New York City-raised singer-songwriter. Having been credited as one of the prominent creators of the Latin alternative rock sound of the late 1990s, his eclectic and unconventional sound has been heard for more than three decades now. Elston is a multicultural, bilingual artist who has performed on stages all over the world, as well as being an award-winning songwriter with major international hits, earning two Grammy nominations, two BMI Songwriting Awards, and six Billboard Top 10 hits throughout his career. We talk about all of this, plus his strong ties to Florida, and more, on this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Here's my conversation with Elston Torres. Welcome to the Film Florida Podcast, Elston. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. So let's start at your beginning. Uh, What's your backstory? Where'd you come from? I was born in Havana, Cuba. I was born in the late 60s. We left Cuba. I only lived in Cuba for a very short time. Uh, I was there first 18 months of my life. And with my mother and my brother, who was five years old at the time, we went to New York where her brother was living, my uncle. My father stayed behind uh, as a political prisoner in Cuba. So I didn't grow up with my father. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in New York. It's where I went to all my schooling, elementary school, high school, college, and where I became a, a musician. I grew up in Washington Heights, up, which is a lot of people mistake Washington Heights as the Bronx, but it's actually part of Manhattan. It's upper, upper Manhattan. And it's the the famous landmark there is the the George Washington Bridge. So uh, born in Cuba, raised in New York City. Let's kind of tie it together really quick. What's your tie to Florida here? You've done quite a few music videos down here, right? Yes. So in 1994, I decided to move down to Florida. And I really reestablished myself here in Florida, in Miami. Uh, mostly lived in Miami. I lived in Broward for a little while. But it was when I moved to South Florida in the mid-90s where I really became a professional musician. I fell into the right, uh, I'd say, the right moment in my career. And I met the right people where and where my career took off. And from there, we did everything that I've done musically has been usually based out of Miami. Some stuff I've done in California, some stuff in New York, but mostly the bulk of my years of recording and producing stuff has been from Florida, including music videos. And now you do a lot of your music videos at local businesses in Miami. Talk about the filming process when you're doing a music video and and talk about maybe a a favorite experience or two. Well, Yes, I, li- I like using uh, I like using different directors uh, for my videos, depending on who's available and who I connect with. I've been uh, I've been doing a lot of videos in in Florida since since the nineties. Most recently, I had an album that came out last year called Nocturno. It was all in Spanish. The first single off the album was a song called Sobrarán, which means what's left over. It's a love song uh, about heartbreak and all that. <laughs> and then it was shot up in Broward, in Pompano, actually, in a place called Bailey Contemporary Arts Center, I believe. Okay. That was a very, very cool shoot. Uh, the director there was Daniel Barrocas, who has done some of my other videos. He's a very talented director and a, and a dear friend of mine as well. His vision is very uh, widespread, where he he sees everything. And from from what I'm wearing to what my attitude, my performance should be, obviously other elements within the the videos and florida is is such a great place to shoot videos the landscape is is so uh it's so florida right Mm -hmm. we try to use those elements to benefit the videos in this particular case that sodaran video was shot indoors for the most part there was some stuff done in the alley in the back of the uh, building which gave it a kind of like a uh, anywhere kind of 
feel to it where we also wanted to take it to the element where it's not necessarily in Florida. It looks a little bit like it could be in Chicago or New York or anywhere else using that alley. And South Florida and Florida in general has a lot of those uh, places where, you know, it's it's just a, a very cool use of space, you know? Sure, sure. Now, let's go back a little ways in your career. You performed in a band that was said to be the first North American Latin rock band to be signed to a major label. What was the band and, and what was that experience like? So when I moved down to Florida in 94, I fell into the hands of two producers who were just starting a new label. Uh, it was called Radio Box. And I was the first artist they signed. It was an indie label back then, which wasn't as, as common as it is now. Mm-hmm. Once I signed with them, we released a, a single called Revolution, Revolucion in Spanish. And it was, it was a song that talked about the Cuban migration during that time. After the success of that single, I realized that I wanted to to create a band, to start a band, to perform locally and nationally. So I went out, found a, a great band of musicians, young guys who were basically still in college, about to graduate. And I started this band called Fulano de Tal. And uh, fu- then we shortened it down to Fulano. Fulano de Tal means... Uh, when you're referring to somebody whose name you don't exactly know, it's kind of like Joe Blow type of thing. Okay. Uh, it's a very popular expression in, in the Latin uh, world. Uh, in all countries, actually, they use Fulano de Tal. So we started the band. The band was great, great musicians in the band. And we started playing out live. And we became one of the most popular bands in not only in Miami, but in the circuit of the Latin rock world. We started traveling a lot to Puerto Rico, to Mexico, to California, New York. And we started getting a buzz and the record labels started uh, coming around and checking us out. Eventually, we got a couple of offers and um, RCA, which BMG RCA, offered us a contract. We signed with them and then Warner Chapel as a publishing company signed me as a writer and things kind of just took off. And we uh, we started touring and recording albums and it was uh, we were the first Latin rock uh, band in the United States to sign it with a major label. So it was quite a cool accomplishment at the, at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Now, your music has been very, very successful in both English and Spanish. How do you continue to find success with the worldwide audience in multiple languages? Because that's not always easy. Yeah, the thing with me is I I try to when I'm as a writer I always try to tap into whatever is going on not just musically but socially and emotionally what's going on in the world especially the world around me obviously I always try to reinvent myself as much as I can maybe not with every album or every record but quite often so I can keep more or less in pace with what's going on. Now, I don't change my style in terms of uh, the genre that I do. I mean, I do what I do as an artist, but I also try to um, I try to accommodate myself to what's going on, whether it's by the way I dress or the lyrical content that I use in the songs. So I always try to maintain that in my career. And I think that's why I've had such a long career in the industry, because I I know that people seek me out because I I try always to be on top of what's going on, you know, without selling myself out. (laughs) Sure. Staying fresh. So you don't get stale. Staying fresh. And not just for, for those who listen to what I do also for myself to keep it interesting for me, because I can sit here and write five songs in in a day, but that's not the point. It's trying to challenge myself as well. Cause I, I want what you listen to, what the audience listens to, to be as exciting for, for you as it is for me. So, you know, yeah, that's cool. Now, uh, National Geographic Channel features you and your music in an original documentary. Tell us the name of the documentary and talk about the importance of, of this project and how you drew from personal experiences in it. That was a very cool project, the National Geographic. It was called La Cuba de Hoy, uh, Cuba Today, basically. The production company approached me. I was recommended by another mutual friend of that production company. And they wanted to highlight an artist's who was Cuban, Cuban American, who had experienced both worlds. And obviously I was honest with them. I my experience of Cuba was really via my mother and my family, because I didn't grow up in Cuba. I left when I was 18 months old. 
But I did grow up in a very Cuban household, even in New York. I, I always say that inside our apartment was Cuba and outside of that was New York. <laughs> Every time I went into my apartment, you know, my mom would be cooking the Cuban food. Cuban music was on, you know, the the culture, just the, the way of life. The original idea of the, the Nat Geo documentary was that they were going to shoot me here in Miami and then shoot me in Cuba. Unfortunately, the Cuba trip didn't happen because since I was born in Cuba, for me to go to Cuba, it's a little bit of a hassle. I have to take out a visa and then it takes like three months and they needed to shoot within the month that we were shooting the uh, my segment here in Miami. So I, I never got to go to Cuba in, in that moment. So it was very cool for my career. At the time, I had released a song called La Vida Cambia, Life Changes. And it talked about how, how life can change within, within a minute or within a split second, uh, for good or for bad. And it was a, it's a very Cuban song. It's got uh, it's like Cuban son, which is a genre of the Cuban music. Mm-hmm. They wound up using that song as a theme song for that documentary. And uh, it was just wonderful. It was a great experience. And I believe that Willie Chirino is in it as well who's a very well-known Cuban artist, a legend here in, in, in the Florida scene, also Cuban. For me, it was it was a, a great uh, way of expressing my feelings towards growing up Cuban, but not in Cuba, mm-hmm. uh, and my relationship to my mother, and um, who unfortunately my mom passed away this year. But it was my connection to Cuba and to that the, the, my whole lifestyle that, for Cubans, it's not that unique. For for anybody else who's not Cuban, it's a pretty unique story, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned in the open, you're a two time Grammy nominated and a BMI award winning singer songwriter, musician, and producer. What did those nominations and those awards mean to you, and did it change your career? Absolutely. You know, the older I get, the more I see that awards and stuff like that. They're great. They're great. I don't criticize them, but at the end of the day, it's really the quality of your work. What those accolades do is that they do, for those of you who don't know you or don't know your work, it kind of justifies or accredits you in a way where the moment I went from being Elson Torres to two-time Grammy-nominated Elson Torres, it changes your perspective. It opens doors, obviously. You know, people look at you a different way. If you're good enough to get nominated, or even to win, obviously you're in a different category from the perception point of view. I still think I'm the same musician I was before I was nominated as I am now, but it is an honor and it is quite thrilling. And it was wonderful to go to the awards and and be there amongst my peers and people that I looked up to. You know, I remember the first time I went to the, uh, the first Grammy or no, it was the second Grammy that I was around, you know, Stevie Wonder was, I could, you know, go shake his hand. Prince was right next to me. Chris Isaac interviewed me and, you know, all these wonderful artists that yeah. I grew up into and, and I was a fan of theirs. So those type of things really uh, make you feel good. It makes you feel like, you know, all the hard work does uh, add to something. So, yeah. Yeah. And now you've written songs and worked on musical projects for a number of really well-known international artists. What's your favorite part about the songwriting process? And and how do you feel when you hear other artists bringing your songs to life? That's a great question. Um, It's thrilling. It's still thrilling to hear hear, uh, an artist that you admire or an artist that's internationally known record and sing one of your songs. I remember the first time I heard one of my songs on the radio being sung by somebody else I, I i had to stop i was driving and i had to stop because i was so i was so proud of that moment because it's you know it's quite thrilling and uh you know this, the the songwriter doesn't get the credit that i always feel they they deserve because yeah. you know know the artist and they don't realize you know there's there's a whole bunch of people that work behind that music and sometimes the artist is a songwriter as well as in my case and you know the case of let's say Elvis Costello who I worked with as well to me the process is always an adventure I've been developing the songwriting muscle for many many years I've been writing since I was a kid uh since I was an early teenager and I've gotten to the point where every time I sit down to write, I know that I'm going to write something, you know, whether it's going to be good or not, that's a different <laughs> that's a different thing. But I know that something was going to come out of that writing session. And I also enjoy writing with other writers uh, and other artists and songwriters, because that brings a different element into that 
process. In the beginning, when I first started collaborating with other artists, it was difficult for me because of my ego. I'm signed to Warner Chapel Publishing. And the woman who was the director back then, one of the first people to connect me with a, uh, with another uh, songwriter to write. And I, I asked her, why, why would you want me to write with somebody else? You signed me because you like my songwriting. And she's like, that's not the point else. And the point is when you write with somebody else, you're going to create something that probably you couldn't create by yourself. And she was absolutely right. And now one of my favorite things to do is collaborate with other writers. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And and now another question on the the writing side. I mean, how often do you write something and then it eventually gets to somebody to perform as opposed to somebody coming to you and saying, I want you to write something specific for me? Um, it, it works both ways. You know, sometimes what's happened to me a lot in my career is I've written songs for myself. And let's say a producer friend of mine is working on an album with a famous artist. And he remembers that song. He presents it to the artist and they love the song and then they record their own version of it. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I used to have a problem with it, but, you know, again, <laughs> and realize that's also my job is to write songs, uh, whether it's for me or for somebody else. So I think that the, that process is, uh, it, it's it's just, it's a really thrilling thing to be able to do that. You know, I, I, I consider myself very lucky that I get to do what I love to do. And I've worked hard. I mean, I've worked hard my whole life to to get where I'm at and, I feel fortunate because I get to work with so many talented people who I can also call friends, uh, which is very, very important to me. Yeah, it's great to hear how your thought process has evolved through the years, too. I, it, that's It's great to hear. Uh, now, uh, DreamWorks Universal Pictures commissioned you to adapt and write the theme song Fearless in Spanish for the animated children's film Spirit Untamed. Share a little bit about that experience on that project. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. So uh, Warner Chapel Music, which is my publisher, contacted me because there was this project out of uh, Los Angeles from DreamWorks. They needed someone to basically adapt the main theme song for the movie Spirit. In Spanish, the main character of the movie was a, I believe, a Mexican-American young girl i think it was a teenager and they send me the details of uh basically what they wanted to keep and what they were flexible on so what i mean by that is what happens is when you tra when you translate or when you adapt a song from one language to another you have to be very careful because you really can't do a literal translation right because it just doesn't work um i've heard it done and it sounds really bad so what i try to do is I uh, listen to the the main song, whatever the song is. In this case, it was that English song called Fearless and get the, the major themes of that song and the feeling of that song. And then what I'll do is I sit down, I start writing lyrics, just ideas, throwing out ideas. I use the literal translations at first. And then I try to find words that are more poetic, more beautiful, more meaningful in that in Spanish in this case it was Spanish I did like two rewrites I sent them my first draft they liked a lot of it and then they they had some ideas and they had some suggestions of certain lines and, and phrases that they weren't crazy about and I went back and wrote it again sent it to, to them again they were 90 percent happy with it and then you know I went back I'm my my biggest critic so I'm sure. very I'm very uh, picky about stuff like that. So until I felt that it was not 100% on my end, that's when I sent him my final draft and it worked out great. And then uh, it was a female voice. So I had a friend of mine who's a great singer sing the demo for me and I sent it to them and they loved it. And then uh, subsequently they gave me another song to work, from, work on from the movie. And I did that as well. And uh, it was great. It was a great experience. And I, I can't wait to do more stuff like that. Well, that's actually really interesting because I've heard, you know, an, an English song and then I've heard a Spanish song and I've thought, that doesn't sound exactly the same. I wonder why. I've never actually understood the process. So it's really interesting to hear how that works. You don't take the literal uh, translation. I, I wasn't aware of that. Unless unless the, the, the person 
who's working on, on that original track tells you, no, I wanted a literal translation, then it's more challenging to make it sound right because right. it's, you just can't. The language, there's two different languages, you know. Uh, sure. Spanish is a lot more romantic, expressive language than English is. Not that English isn't, but it's, you know, Spanish is one of the romantic languages. So, yeah, like French or, yes. you know, not, not like German. <laughs> no, I, I, I took uh, Spanish in high school and college. I uh, unfortunately don't remember a whole lot about it, but that is one thing I definitely remember was the how the, 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 the teachers and the professors were always explaining the differences in just the tone and the, the feel between English and Spanish. So yeah, that's actually, I remember that part. Now you mentioned Elvis Costello. You were commissioned to translate several of his classic hits into Spanish for a tribute album. What was it like to translate such, you know, work from a, an influential artist like Elvis Costello? First of all, it was thrilling because not only did I uh, love the challenge, I am also a huge Elvis Costello fan. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually one of my one of my mentors growing up. One of the people that I listened to a whole lot when I was growing up. And actually, when I was starting out my career as a Latin rock artist, some people refer to me as the Latin El Elvis Costello. <laughs> I guess I listened to him enough to <laughs> have that influence. And before before I actually worked on the album, me and Elvis kind of became friends because we had mutual friends. My friend Sebastian Chris wound up being his producer for the last few albums. And in one of his tours, he stopped by in Florida and we went to the show, went backstage, got to meet him. And I invited him and the band to lunch the next day, they said yes. We took them out to lunch at Versailles, Cuban place here in sure. Miami. And it was a wonderful get together. And after that, me and Elvis stayed in touch via emails. And then whenever he come into town, he'd invite me to a show. So we had a friendship. As a matter of fact, recently when my mom passed away, he sent me a really nice email. With mm. My condolences. So before that, when the album idea came out, uh, it was for the album This Year's Model, which is one of his best known albums. My my friend Sebastian Chris, who was a producer on the album, said, how many songs would you like to tackle? I said, as many as you want me to do. Mm -hmm. And that was very challenging, talking about what we were talking about before, little translations and adaptations. Because as we know, Elvis is a great writer, and he's yeah. very specific and very detailed. Um, I mean, he, his lyrics are so sometimes so visual. Like um, So there's a lot of stuff that couldn't get translated because he was referring to certain places or cards or or, or, or whatever yeah so there was a lot of back and forth with me and elvis and i would write listen i can express it this way or this way and it all worked out great i wound up doing five songs and i think four songs wound up on the album and then i remember seeing elvis again on tour after that and he tells me elson i don't know how you did it i don't know how you mm -hmm. translate songs from english to spanish and so my friend it wasn't easy but I, I had a thrill doing it, and thank you for being such a great writer and giving me that challenge. Yeah, that's very cool. Now, I don't want to—I don't want to make you feel old or anything, but you've been doing this for a long time since the early '90s. How have you seen the music and the entertainment industry shift over that time? Oh, I don't feel old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a long time, yes, but I don't feel old. Uh, the music industry has changed a lot. It's changed a whole lot. Uh, some say in a good way, some say not in not such a good way. Yeah. Uh, I, I I see it. I mean, I see it both ways. The positive way the music industry has changed is that music has become a lot more accessible now, not just for fans, but for the artists. Before, the main goal was to sign with a major label. That was the goal for, of every artist coming out of the gate. It was like, you know, that was our goal. That was my goal back in, in the 90s, you know, and I, I got to reach my goal. I signed to a major label. But now that's not the same goal. I mean, major labels are a whole different thing now. They're not, uh, they're not into developing artists as much as they used to be. It's more a social media, internet, streaming uh world this when music went from being a physical tangible product to a a not tangible product it just changed it changed the perception of what uh of what we do as musicians and what the industry does producers and engineers because unfortunately for me this is the sad part is a uh, it's not so much our generation or or you know or the older generation but the newer generation 
I don't want to say the values music, but since it's not a physical product, they don't see the work that goes behind it. You know, growing up as a kid, most of the times that either when I worked or when my mom would give us allowance, the first thing I could do is go to the store in the corner of the record store and buy the record that I wanted to get. That's how, yep. you know, that was my treat to myself. That doesn't exist anymore, you know, for this generation is, you know, what's okay. Taylor Swift just dropped a new song. All right, I listen to it. You'll listen to it a few times. And if you're a big fan, I'm sure you listen to it a lot. But it's it's become such a um a seamless thing where music just comes out. It's so I heard, I don't know how accurate this is, but I heard over a hundred thousand songs comes out in a year. I mean in a in a week. A hundred thousand wow. songs in a week. <laughs> I mean, how can you even wrap your head around that? Right. When you release something new, if you don't do promo really, really uh, strong promo in the first few days, your music just gets lost in the shuffle of stuff. So again, it's a challenging time, but it's also a very thrilling time because now pretty much anybody can be an artist. You can release something and record it very well, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, obligatory question here. What's your advice for young musicians and songwriters? Oh, I love this uh, question. I, you know, I get asked all the time. My go-to answer always is like, it's be the artist that you want to be. Don't be the artist that somebody else is. You know, what do I mean by that? Find your own path as an artist, as a musician, whatever you whatever you are. If you're a guitar player, a drummer, or a singer song, singer songwriter like I am, or just a singer, whatever you are, find your own path. Don't don't try to imitate other people. Uh yes, influences. We all get influenced by other artists. I was influenced by many artists. And I have elements of those artists in me. You know, whenever somebody listens to my song, it goes, oh, Beatles, yes, Beatles. Yeah, I just the Beatles a whole lot. And I still do. Uh or Elvis Costello or Elvis Presley or whoever it is. But once you get that those influences and you've developed your craft enough, then find your own voice. Don't don't try to Im emulate or imitate other artists because those artists already exist and they've already had their own success. Find your own success. And and success today is very different in the music industry than what it used to be. This whole idea of conquering the world or being a super superstar that doesn't really exist that much anymore. Okay, there's Taylor Swift, yes. <laughs> Bad Bunny, there's people like that. But it's not at the level, the mania of the say the Beatles or 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 even Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley or those those giant of the of the music industry. So find your audience and find what you do and craft that and make it the best that you can be, not somebody else can be. Yeah. Now you mentioned a couple of your English speaking influences. Who were some of the the Spanish speaking uh, artists that influenced you? Um, I have a few. Uh, Juan Luis Guerra, who is a uh, Dominican singer-songwriter who's been very successful for many years. He's a, an amazing writer. Uh, he actually went to Berkeley uh, up in uh, Boston, uh, born in, in the uh, Dominican, uh, Dominican Republic. There's an artist out of Uruguay who lives in Spain named Jorge Drexler, who's an amazing singer-songwriter. And um, Kevin Johansson, who is a Argentinian uh, singer-songwriter. I like a Julieta Venegas, a Mexican singer songwriter. She's a very special songwriter. So there's there's few there's a few. I, I I've been influenced by both uh, and by Cuban music, obviously. When I visited Social Club, that album changed my life when I first heard it. And I and I was able to travel to Cuba a few years back with my with my mom, and I was able to soak in my culture in first person because I I hadn't been able to go to Cuba since since i left as a baby and once i was there i realized wow i really am cuban because the music uh, a lot of my music comes from that as well yeah now i want to circle back to something you mentioned at the very beginning and, and i don't want to make any assumptions was your dad ever able to get out of cuba my dad did get out of cuba he got out during the uh, mariel boat lift in the 80s i guess that was and he was able to get to new york where I met him for the first time when I was 16, 16, 17. Um, it was, it was, it was a, little, a bit strange, you know, but yeah. some, I went with my grandmother, his mother and, and his brother, my uncle. And they said, this is your dad. And I looked at him like, this is my dad. <laughs> mm -hmm. A hug. And uh, we, you know, throughout the years, my, my dad passed uh, in 2007. Uh, 
we never really had a full relationship. Yeah. He had a relationship, but it wasn't, I guess, because all the years apart, you know, it didn't. And by the time I met him, I was pretty much, I wasn't a man yet, but I was getting there. I was 16, 17. Yeah. And I had lived my whole life without a without a dad, um, but it was it was nice to to close that circle and finally yeah. meet him. He he had he had a very adventurous life, which you know that's a whole other interview. Yep. <laughs> uh, my dad was a very uh, different kind of man, so uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm glad that uh, you were at least able to to meet him, and, and I'm sure that was uh, like you said, close that circle. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elston, where can people keep up on everything you're doing? What what do they need to know? You know, where to find you and plug away. Tell us tell us more. Well, I'm definitely on all social media, so you can check me out on uh, you know on Instagram. Just look for my name, Elston Torres. I'm also on Facebook, obviously, TikTok. I have a TikTok account. Uh, even though I was refusing to do it, my, my publisher said, you have to do it. Everybody's on TikTok. <laughs> I'm on TikTok on, uh, I guess it's called X now. Yep. I'm on there. I don't get on there that much. And I have my own official website, which is very easy. It's just my first name, elston.info. And that's always updated. I always have my most recent videos and where I'm playing and everything else. So I would say those are the best bets. And for music streaming services, I'm on Spotify, Elston Torres. Please join me there. Uh, and Apple Music and Amazon. So I'm everywhere, pretty much. Well, Elston, um, I, I don't get to talk music all that often on the podcast. It's it's typically kind of some traditional film and television stuff. So I really enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot. Uh, thanks for taking time to be on the Film Florida podcast. We, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you, John. I had a wonderful time and what great questions you had. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org and like or follow our social media pages. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. Check out Film Florida merchandise at filmflorida.creator-spring.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.